Okay. Uh, we're in, where are we? We're in week six of, of, our, um, of our study on um, Genesis, the creation account. So I want to talk about two things today that are implied from that reading. The first thing I want to talk about is the fossil record and the myths and at times outright lies that have been spread about it. And the second thing I want to talk about today is blood. Since it is in these verses that we see the creation of the mechanism that God put in place to save the world and reconcile it to himself. Uh, before I do that, Meryl is texting me through the service. <laughs> <laughs> and she's just had a visit from the cardiologist and the cardiologist says she's, th she's stable, which is a great piece of news with a big smiley and she thanks you for your prayers. I just thought you'd appreciate that. Things aren't too wrong with her if she still texts them. So today we're going to look at the way that God created all life on the earth, in the sky and under the waters. And so God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind and God saw that it was good. So having read that passage I want to talk about the fossil record. We have to try and reconcile what we see and hear on the TV every week with the Bible record. I mean you'd be forgiven for thinking that the fossil record shows these creatures slowly evolving into existence instead of suddenly appearing. Right? That's, that's the story we're told. And I think that by now we, we all know that the godfather of the theory of evolution was Charles Darwin. But what most people are unaware of is that his strongest oppon opponents weren't clergymen. His strongest opponents were fossil experts. And Darwin admitted that the state of the fossil evidence was the most obvious and gravest objection which can be urged against my theory. And because of the fossil evidence, all the most eminent paleontologists and all our greatest geologists have unanimously and often vehemently maintained that species do not change. So the fossil record is marked by two great principles. The first is stasis, which means that most species are unchanged in all their documented history. The way they look when they first appear in the fossil record is the way they look when last appearing in the fossil record. They have not changed. And second, sudden appearance, which means in any local area, a species does not arise gradually, but appears all at once and fully formed. Okay, all, oh, just, just something just popped into my head then. Have you all seen the, the pictures of the evolution of the horse? This funny little thing gets bigger and bigger. Sometimes you've got two toes, sometimes you've got three toes, sometimes you've got one thing. And you've got all these funny looking things that they say evolve. What, what the... the, the the people didn't say was that in every single level that they found those so-called um, proto-horses, they found skeletons of modern horses. All right, so modern horses are right there at the beginning of the fossil record. They arrived in the fossil record fully formed and they're all the way through it. Okay, so that's the sort of stuff that we, we see in our kiddies' textbooks. Uh, you know, in museums and stuff. It's just nonsense. Philip E. Johnson, the author of Darwin on Trial, wrote, If evolution means the gradual change of one kind of organism into another, the outstanding characteristic of the fossil record 
is the absence of evidence for evolution. In another piece he wrote, evolutionary biologists have been able to pretend to know how complex biological systems originated only because they treated them as black boxes. Now that biochemists have opened up the black boxes and seen what's inside, they know the Darwinian theory is just a story and not a scientific explanation. Okay, so they give the evidence um, of a very large um, sedimentary rock deposit called the Bighorn Basin, it's in Wyoming in the United States, and contains a continuous record of fossil, develop, fossil deposits for what geologists say is five million years. Because this record is so complete, paleontologists assumed a positive trail of evolution could be found. Instead, the fossil record does not convin convincingly document a single transition from one species to another, not one. Evolutionist Niall Eldridge wrote, we paleontologists have said that the history of life in the fossil records supports the story of gradual evolution, all the while knowing that it does not. Either evolution happens slowly with each tiny change building up on the last over billions of years or the changes came as quick leaps. What would a quick leap look like? Sort of like a mouse hatching out of a dinosaur egg. <laughs> right? That's the sort of thing they're talking about. So the fossil record totally rejects the idea of millions of tiny changes. When we get to do the flood account, I'll talk about how that all happened, okay? How we get all these different rock layers and why what's where it is. We'll deal with that in the, in the, um, in the flood. So while we admire the faith of those who believe in such hopeful monsters, it seems far more rational to believe in a wise, creating and designing God. So day six, God makes land animals. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. This thing is crashing on me every few minutes. You can get there. Come on. Okay. Just like he did with the vegetation. What are you doing? get there. I've got no idea. We'll have to go without it. So just like he did with the vegetation on day four and the birds and the sea creatures on day five, God made the beasts of the earth, each according to its kind. And when we look at the infinite variety of the animal kingdom, both living and extinct, we must be impressed by God's creative power, as well as his sense of humour. I mean, any being who makes the giraffe, the platypus and the peacock is a god of joy and humour. To a peahen, the most attractive peacocks are the ones with the biggest fans. But the big fan on the tail makes it difficult for the peacock to escape predators. Therefore, the peahen rewards the peacock with the least chance of survival. This is a great problem for the idea of survival of the fittest. All right, to put this into an Australian context, 
The koala eats a diet of leaves loaded with pure diesel fuel. Yep, you can run a track to leaves. Yeah, sorry, you can run a tractor on eucalyptus oil if you have to. Right? So if evolution is the natural way of ensuring the survival of the fittest, you would think that the koala with a diet like that, so full of energy, that it can run a machine, you would be forgiving for thinking that the koala could run like a greyhound at the slightest hint of danger, such as a bushfire. Right? That's what survival of the fittest would tell us. But no. The evolutionary process shows that over the so-called so 25 million years in the fossil record of koala evolution, they have gotten smaller and only eating gum tree leaves. The, res the net result of all this is that we have a national emblem that sleeps all day and in the event of a bushfire cannot run away and is burned up terribly in the bushfires. It doesn't seem like the theory of evolution is working too well for the koala, does it? So God creates sea creatures and birds on the previous day and land animals on day six. So day, days five and six are notable for another reason. This is the first time that God creates something that he calls a living creature. The word is nefesh in the Hebrew. And it has some unique qualities. The fish are nefesh. The birds are nefesh. The animals are nefesh. People are nefesh. Right? Living creatures. So the word nefesh in Hebrew has some unique qualities. You notice, for example, that in the account you hear them reproducing, you hear them multiplying, and you hear them being able to make more of their own kind. That's a unique quality of a living being, or a living creature now. Plants can do the same. But you know, those plants were not called living beings. Not in the same way that these animals have been called living creatures. There's life there, but God sets apart the life of the animal kingdom in a way that's distinct from the way he designates life generally in a biological sense. And in what way do you think he does that? What do you think separates the living creatures of day five and six from the rest of the creation account? You have to think really hard about this. What makes them so special? There's a common denominator in every single one of them. Fish, birds and animals. What did you say? Blood. Blood. Living creatures possess blood. And the idea that life is in the blood becomes a very important spiritual truth that God uses in scripture from this point forward. So here we are right in the very first verses of chapter 1 of Genesis and, and the plan of salvation is in place. Alright? We don't talk about ver blood very much in mainstream conservative Christianity. The old time Pentecostals and others similar to that understood the significance of blood right from the get go. We used to do choruses and whole song services of nothing but blood songs. Right? Thanks for the blood. The blood of Calvary. There's power in the blood. There's power in the blood. All those songs, just amazing things. And the point is, if, if you possess blood, by definition you can experience death in the sense of a living soul experiencing the end of life in itself. And God uses this in a variety of ways, for example. Excuse me.
later in Genesis, after the flood, God says this to mankind, and I'm not sure that I can show it to you. Yes. Did we get there? Yep. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And for your lifeblood I will require a reckoning. From every beast I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. So up until now, man has been a vegetarian. Up until the flood. Right? In the garden, every beast was created vegetarian. There was no death before the fall in the garden. Okay? Imagine a T-Rex eating veggies. They actually did. Their teeth are actually very weak. They got very short roots on them. I've seen one. Yeah. They could just chomp on a watermelon, you know. <laughs> so in this passage, God is establishing a new rule for life on earth following the flood, which is that if someone were to take the life of another, they themselves would lose their life as a penalty for doing so. But our focus this morning is on this quality of blood, that blood itself, God says, is the source of life. In the simple biological sense, we understand it very well. But spiritually, he is saying blood will become a representation of life. We know how God later uses this representation when he gives the law to Israel. In Leviticus, he says, for example, that a leader who has sinned should get a male goat, lay his hands on it to transfer his guilt onto the goat, and then the goat is killed. Verse 25, Then the priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of the burnt offering and pour out the rest of its blood at the base of the altar of burnt offering. And so the priest shall make atonement for him for his sin, and he shall be forgiven. Clearly we begin to see God using this concept of living things, having a special form of life, which is embodied or represented by the blood of that individual. Whether it is an animal, or a bird, or a fish, its life is in its blood. Drain its blood, and the creature dies. This then gives us an opportunity to understand the consequence of sin, which is death, and the need for an atoning to cover sin, which is to take the life of one and assign it to another. In this case, the life of an animal of the sacrificial system was represented by the blood of that animal, and it was assigned to cover the sin of a human being. And of course the writer of Hebrews tells us that it was never to be a once and for all offering. It wasn't sufficient. But it was temporary and it was symbolic. It was intended to teach something so that we would understand where true atonement comes from. Where true, true forgiveness of sin comes from. Later we get that in the New Testament when Jesus, speaking of himself, says, For this is my blood holding the cup and speaking of the wine that was used in the last supper he says this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins John says at the time of Christ's death one of his soldiers one sorry one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out so in day five and six we are seeing animals created 
And the emphasis here is on a special kind of life. Life that can be lost. Life that can be transferred. As in a sense, spiritually speaking, speaking. That blood can be used to make a point of life being transferred. And God intended to use that later with his son. Now you remember, remember in Revelation 13 8, which tells us that Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In other words, Jesus knew he was going to die for the sins of the world before the world was even created. So that's why we see this happening in the creation account on day five. Birds, animals, fish, whales, dolphins, seals, right? All these creatures, their life is in their blood. Their life is in their blood. So here we see another detail in the creation made so in order for God to use it later to explain something spiritually important to all of us. The idea of the movement of life from one person to another. That is all we need of course because of sin. We stand in jeopardy before a holy and just God unless and until he covers that sin by appointing someone else to our place and for us to receive the life of a perfect sacrifice in place of our own sinful life, which was of course to be by faith in Jesus Christ himself. I think this would be a good time to move to the communion table. Amen? Amen. Amen.